I'd like to focus your thinking on a little phrase found in the famous 1 Corinthians 13. Verses 7 and 8 read, Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And then Paul adds these words, love never fails. Quite some years ago, there was a young man who lived in a very dysfunctional family in New Jersey. Uh, he was a twin. His parents had had some measure of success. I think they had a transport company. I'm not sure exactly, but they had been trapped in um, alcohol and gambling and had basically lost everything. And at one point, Tom, this young man who became a dear friend of mine, uh, he actually considered ending his own life. But as he thought about it, he asked himself the question, what do I need to make sense of life, to go on living? And the answer he came up with was, I, I need real love. And he hadn't seen that in his own upbringing. But there was a family, one of the young men who was of his age at the local high school, that was quite different and that showed him respect and concern. So when Tom, when the family basically imploded and Tom was thrown out on the street, I think he was about maybe 16 years of age, I'm not sure, in high school, uh, he thought maybe these people would take him in. He showed up at their door. They already had a large family of eight children, but they shuffled things around and gave Tom a place to stay. And he said for the first time in his life, he saw real love. And they explained to him that it wasn't their love. It was the love of God she had brought in their hearts by the Holy Spirit. It was Jesus' love for him and for uh, all of humanity. And, and it wasn't long until Tom put his trust in the Lord Jesus. He sought to reach out to his family, but that did not go well. The family was very resistant. And yet Tom took as his a life verse these words, love never fails. And eventually had the joy of seeing his father profess to be saved, his sister, and his twin brother who had beat him quite badly when he came to the family and told him he'd been saved, was still very alienated from him. And we were praying for this brother, John. John had moved to Florida, and Tom had a dream one night in which he thought he could see his brother considering taking his own life. And so he flew down, knowing he might only have a short few minutes with his brother, arrived, I think, on their birthday, the shared birthday of the twins. And sure enough, he was considering that. And so Tom pled with them to seek the Lord. Well, at that time, I was very busy traveling all over preaching. I had one Sunday in Florida, and that one Sunday was in the town where John was living. He was supposed to be in jail for quite a long period of time, but uh, inexplicably, he was released from jail and was able to come to the gospel meeting where I was preaching. Afterwards, we sat and talked, and he said, you know, I, I've decided I'm going to go home and, and confess all my sins. And I said, John, that, that sounds very encouraging to me, but here's the problem. I happen to know your background, and in your background, your religion, the idea is that every week you, you pick up all the rotten apples and you bring them and confess them and, and then start over again. I used to have a rotten apple tree like that in my yard. And these little green sour apples were no good for anything. And the kids used to go out and try and make games out of it and throw them into bags, uh, like hanging from the trees, uh, like playing basketball, something to, to make sense of this prolific tree. That all it produced was these sour little apples. And one day I realized, you know, the problem's deeper than that. Cut it down. Why cumbereth at the ground? And, and if I'd been a better gardener, 
I could have grafted into that life a new life, a new kind of life that would have produced a new kind of fruit. And I said, that's what's happened to your brother. The scripture says, receive with meekness the engrafted word that you might grow by it. And if we're willing to accept God's diagnosis of us, not only that we're sinners, but that we're hopeless sinners and we can't fix ourselves and that we need a savior and we need to turn from our religious efforts, from our own good works and cast ourselves on the mercy of God and receive this new life as a gift in Christ. And the spirit of God then will begin to produce this new fruit. Well, I believe John got saved that day, but he had a very difficult life ahead, eventually moved up into New England where there was virtually no evangelical work in his area. His wife had a serious drinking problem. All her friends, it was just a very unhappy situation. And John just was worn down, worn down. And eventually, I'm afraid, he, he ended his own life. And it was just such a sad chapter. Well, the family was going to have the service at, at the local Catholic church, and, and, uh, and yet Tom pled with them to let me come and participate as well. Well, I had a call from the priest, and uh, he said, listen, uh, five minutes for a homily, that's it. And I said, well, uh, I'm not going to be long, but I think I need a little more than five minutes. He said, well, I hope you're not like one of these other evangelical preachers that we had a week ago, and he was spent all his time railing against the Catholic Church. And I said, well, I'm not there to do anything except try to provide a little comfort for the family. Now, when I got there, the priest invited me into his office, and um, as we talked, I said to him, listen, if we're going to share this time together, I'd like to know where you stand with God. And he was a little dumbfounded, didn't quite know what to say. And so I said, well, let me tell you my story. And so I was able to tell him how I was raised in a Bible-believing home and my parents were godly people, but that didn't do me any good other than to expose me to the gospel because I needed to be personally saved. I needed to put my trust as a child. I put my trust in the Lord Jesus and he changed my life. And the message I have for everybody is the same. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. We're all sinners, and we can be saved by simple faith in Christ. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. He that has the Son has life and shall not come into judgment, but is already passed from death into life. I said, this is the message we have. Not that people might hope so and work at it and pay and pray, but, but that they might receive as a gift eternal life in the Lord Jesus. Well, he grew quite sober and he said, you know, I, I've been a priest for many years and, and I, I have to confess to you that just two years ago, I had some serious thoughts about my own standing before God. And I can't quite describe it the way you've described it, but I had dealings with God and uh, I, I wasn't sure exactly where the man stood. But anyway, I said to him, listen, I, I want to explain to you that I'm not trying to be rude or offensive, but if you get involved in praying for the dead or praying to the saints or doing other things, celebrating the Mass in an attempt to somehow improve this man's future state, I'm sorry, I, I won't be able to participate. But I just want you to know that, that uh, I appreciate the opportunity to participate here today and thank you for the privilege. Well, when we came out, the crowd was there. And what do you know? The priest got up and basically said, this is Mr. Nicholson, he's a man of God. We, we believe in ecumenism and we're going to turn the whole program over to him. And so he just gave me the opportunity of getting up and speaking from the word of God and seeking to provide both direction in the gospel and also comfort. You know, the Lord has a corner on the market. So if you're going to be comforted, you're going to have to go to him for it. He's the God of all comfort, and you'll have to go to him for it. Well, afterwards, we went back to the widow's home, and she and her friends were in the other room and didn't seem too interested in interacting with me. 
but the, the um, so-called uh, godfather, the, this of course is when the infant is sprinkled, the godparents make certain promises on behalf of this poor little sinner child that just got wet with the hopes that someday that child will be confirmed and confirm, that is, agree with the promises that were made relative to uh, the child when it didn't know any better. And uh, many churches do this sort of thing. But uh, in any case, a big brassy New York businessman, and he came and he said to me, well, that was quite a sermon, he said. Uh, You're one of those born-againers? And I said, well, by the grace of God, I have been born again. He said, well, I like to think I'm a Christian too, but I'm not one of the born-again type. I said, well, that's very interesting. You know what Jesus said about that? He was speaking to a very religious man, one of the religious leaders of his day. And he said to this man, there's only one type that gets to see the kingdom of God, and that is the born-again type. He said, now, do you think that's one of the reasons for the funeral today, so that I could hear this message? And I said, that could very well be. He said, well, let's sit down and talk about this. And so we sat down, and for almost an hour, I was able to share the gospel with this dear man. I don't know if he got saved that day or not, but I thought to myself, all of these connections go back to the commitment of a young man who had been badly treated by his family but he made a commitment to this principle that love never fails. And you may be in difficult situations. You maybe have difficult neighbors, difficult relatives, difficult marriage. But this is the promise of God that this supernatural love, not our own love, that wears out in no time, but the supernatural love of God shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit That love never fails. So keep loving people for Jesus' sake. Not so that they love us back, but so that they learn to love the source of that love, Christ in us.